We're up to desktop and server vulnerabilities here. Um, I just want to mention, as far as scheduling goes, I have Rachel Chalmers coming next Tuesday. She's a guest speaker. Uh, she came several years ago, and people were very happy with her. So she, this is a career advice class. It's a good thing to go to if you want to find out what training to get and what jobs are out there. And uh, Pico CTF starts March 31. That's, um, I highly recommend doing it. Um, and I'll have more to say about that. I'm going to talk about one of the problems I solved at Easy CTF later in the class. But I won't record that because it's uh, poor style to publish anything about a contest while it's still underway. Anyway, so, um, so we're going to talk about the vulnerabilities of Windows and Linux and some historical vulnerabilities that are important. Uh, when I first, when I've been in this business for a few years, I started to wonder if I should cut out the old stuff. And I cut out a few things, but you can't cut them out too much because they keep coming back. Every time you think things are over, like 32-bit operating systems, I thought maybe they were over and everything 64 bit, and then they brought out cell phones and iPads. And those things are all 32-bit. And then I thought these old 90s vulnerabilities like the, uh, the land attack were over, and then they brought out portable devices and brought all of them back. And then they bring in containers, and it just, you know, computers are so versatile that the old computers turn out to be useful for a new purpose over and over again. So none of these vulnerabilities seem to ever go away. People just keep reviving the old systems with the old vulns and bringing them back in a new context. So anyway, um, Windows originally had a ton of vulnerabilities because it was Microsoft's official policy to ignore security when designing their product um, until 2002 because there were not very many hackers. What there were was a large number of people just beginning to learn how to use computers, which were relatively new, and the main interest was just to make it easy to use. That was the big concern because everybody was just sort of baffled. You know, you might not be old enough to remember a time when you had to type on an impact typewriter and draw figures with a pen, but I did. I lived through that, and the computer revolution was awesome. You, you could look a lot better, but at first, everyone was just baffled how to make computers do anything. So it, but since 2002, Microsoft made security their number one priority, and they improved their product line greatly with XP Service Pack 2, and then they are improving it much more with every version, and Microsoft is now probably the most heavily defended um, operating system on the market, in my opinion, although I'm probably not enough of an expert in operating systems to make a uh, very authoritative statement about that. Windows seems to have the most defenses. It's also under the most attack, so it still gets compromised a lot. Um, Linux and the Mac have very few defenses. The Mac typically has no firewall, no antivirus by default. Most people run it that way forever because it's not under much attack, so you don't need all those defenses. Anyway, that's the game here. So the big change from Microsoft point of view is up until um, Windows XP, every operating system had every service just turned on by default. So you install a Windows 2000 server and it's already setting up web pages, FTP files, Telnet, and all sorts of things are all just turned on for your convenience. You can just use it. And they're all turned on with a default password or no password for your convenience. So you can use it because Microsoft's philosophy was that most people are not connected to the internet. They're in their company LAN and that's all they want is for it to be easy to use and security is really not an issue. But of course, after that, they switched it to where everything is disabled by default. You have to turn it on. Every, you have to add a password to it so it's more secure and so on. And that's much more work for the administrator. Microsoft tried to pretend that you didn't need to go take a class to learn how to run Windows. It was supposed to be so easy to use you could just do it, even the servers. And around after they got to like 2003, they admitted you really have to take a class, you really have to get certification, you know. Uh, there were Windows NT classes, but they were really pretty simple. And anyway. Um, so every version of, the, of every product has an endless chain of vulnerabilities. Um, back in the 90s, you would buy a piece of software. It would come with you in a box with a floppy disk, and that was it. You would just use it. Now every company, and it's very difficult for them to adapt to this, so companies had a model, like somebody making like car parts. You make your product, you put it in the box, you sell it to the consumer, you get your money, and it's done. We don't need to do anything more until we make the next version, then we put it in the box and get the consumer to give us more money for it. But now, publishing a piece of software is like having a child. They keep coming back. They need more and more stuff forever. You've got to be spending more and more money patching your product forever. So Microsoft is moving from selling you at one price to a subscription model where you pay every month to use Office because that reflects what they have to do. They have to keep on working on it forever and updating it because of these endless chain of vulnerabilities that keep coming out. Um, you have to keep patching it. So you're not done designing a product when you sell it. You basically have to keep on maintaining it forever with a lot of constant work and money. Yeah? I, I think 2006 was an interesting analogy 
Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, it's been out in beta testing. I, I haven't heard much about it. I know it has a few new security defenses in Server 2016, but um, is the final product out? I think it might still be in beta. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, it won't change anything qualitative. I mean, it'll have a ton of defenses and a ton of bugs, and there'll be a constant chain of updates. Well, a lot of people get frustrated at the constant cycle of updates, but there is a, the reason is that it is very expensive for Microsoft to support old products. Everyone does. Apple, for example, ruthlessly abandons everything more than the current version and one version back. Anything older, they just abandon. Kali Linux is the same. If you try to run Kali Linux 2016, not 16.1 or 16.2, you will not be able to update stuff or install new software because they took down the repositories. Because you have to focus on maintaining a product. And the latest version has all the supporting features to fix. Figuring out how to fix a problem in an old version that doesn't have the support structure is very difficult for a company. Microsoft is the best of a bad lot. Microsoft actually supports stuff that's maybe 10 years old. I, I think 2003 server just hit its end of life, I think this year or late last year. So people were using it, what, 13 years after it was written. That's very expensive for Microsoft. Because how do they patch a vulnerability when they have to add in 10 years of development plus the new problem? It gets more and more difficult to keep old products safe. So every company has an end of life when they issue an official statement saying we are abandoning this product. We should recommend that everybody quit using it and it will never be safe again because if we find any new problems, we're not going to fix them and you're just on your own. And some people continue to use them. You can just be sloppy and not care if you get infected. You can disconnect those machines from the internet and keep using them, or you can trust third-party products like antivirus products to add some security to it, but you will find that modern antivirus products won't run on those old operating systems either. Increasingly, nothing modern will run because they don't have the uh, underpinnings necessary. So that is very frustrating to everybody, though, that you have to keep buying new versions of everything. Your staff keep have to getting trained. You have to keep replacing servers that are working with new versions that are more complicated and frustrating, but that's the way it is. It's, it's, and everyone, everyone finds it annoying when you have to. Anyway, so um, one issue is the file system. If um, a hard disk is just a device that can store bits, stores blocks of 512 bytes at a time, uh, I think we call those sectors. And um, you could just store data on it any way you want to. And there are some uh, technical devices that actually use the disk or the storage device just as a linear storage to store a bunch of ones. But normally, in a file system, you want to store files in folders so you can delete folders and move folders and give them file names and have dates in them and such, and that's what the file system does. It uses up a small portion of the disk for record-keeping purposes, like I think it's about 7% in an NTFS volume, and then it keeps you can put everything in folders and files and move them around. So it's very important. You can't use a disk without being organized somehow. And the original one that Microsoft used was the file allocation table. Now, this was originally designed for floppy disks before hard disks existed at any reasonable price, <coughs> like back in the 70s. And so it was very small volumes and very small files, when your entire disk would be something like 300 kilobytes. So it just had a flat table called the file allocation table. It had a spot for the file name, beginning cluster, number of clusters, and like a uh, creation date and a few bits for attributes. Your file could be hidden or system or read only. There's like five bits of attributes. And the file name has to fit in a little table so there's only room for eight characters, a dot, and three more characters. That's as long as your file name can be because it's just a flat table with no flexibility, whatever. That was fat. File allocation table, this one table would index the disk. And um, that's what Microsoft used. They it's, it took the same system designed for floppies, which was FAT12 with a 12-bit addressing scheme, and updated it to FAT16 with a 16-bit addressing scheme, so your disks could get as large as 2 gigabytes, and then um, uh, updated it to FAT32 that can handle larger disks, and on you go. But the main problem with this thing was there was no security built into it at all. There was no permission structure. There was no way to take a file and say, administrators can read this file, but other users can't read this file. There was nowhere to put that information. There was just one line with, I think, 64 bytes to store about every file, and there was nowhere to put a list of permissions. 
physical access to the drive meant you were allowed to read and, read and execute everything on that file. That's all. Because it was back before the internet. So having the machine in your hand meant you could do anything with the machine. That was all that anybody thought about it. So when Microsoft brought out Windows NT in 1993 was when they seriously decided to compete with Novell. Before this, Novell owned the server market. Microsoft made operating systems only for desktops, and servers were run by, by manufactured by Novell, which owned that market, had like 90% of the market. They made servers that could share files over a network and such. And Microsoft decided to compete with them and made Windows NT, the new technology, and this had NTFS, the new technology file system. And now, instead of having a fixed table with only so many bytes to store information about each file, it had a database, and the records could grow as big as they had to for each file called the master file table. So now you could have a file name and a creation date and the starting cluster and the number of clusters. And then you could add more information like administrators can read and write, other users can only read, Joe can't access it at all. You can have a long chain of permissions attached to each file and it would be as long as you need it to be. It will grow the record for that, for that item as big as it has to to store all the information about it. So that's big. Um, and all the, there are many versions of NTFS, but you don't notice it much as you use Windows. They're all very much compatible. Um, you very rarely run into a bug from the wrong NTFS version, but they've added more and more things to it. One thing, which is kind of nuts, is they added alternate data streams. And this is something I've never heard before. This is something Microsoft added for compatibility with Apple. Because Apple started out in entertainment back when Microsoft was just for business. So their product could play music and movies and everything. And they met the needs of music and movie people because they want to have the music you listen to and then they want to have copyright information and then they want to have the album picture and the liner notes all tied to the same file name. So the file name is like a directory now and it has many different streams of data connected to it. One to play the music, one to see the album art, one for the copyright information. That's called alternate data streams. So I'm not going to demonstrate it. It's not that exciting anymore, but you can make here, I can echo I have a file named Foo, so I just put six bytes in that file, and then I can echo some text into Foo colon bar. So you take the file name and pretend it's a drive and put a colon like it was A colon or C colon and put a file in there, and now Foo says it's only six bytes big, but it's not. If you, if you do directory slash R, you'll see that this file named Foo has two data streams, one six byte big and one 31 bytes big called Foo colon bar data. So you can have multiple streams of data coming from the same file name. It's not really that important. The only thing about it is there was a period of time when uh, virus scanners did not know to look at these alternate data streams. and It was a place you could hide things. Um, the malware authors are always trying to find a sneaky place to hide nasty things. One thing that I heard of back in the days of maybe Windows 2000 was people would get infected and the and virus would put kiddie porn files in your recycle bin and then serve them over the internet from there, so you won't notice them. They always try to find somewhere nasty to hide stuff. They'll hide things in restore points. They'll hide off partitions on the disk you don't see. You know, they've, they've, they're, they're any weird place to put data, the bad guys will quickly start putting bad things in there, and it takes a while before the antivirus and defense companies know that they have to scan that too. Anyway, um, yeah. Um, is it Like, do their files at the root level for that? I'm not sure. They might. Um, you certainly, um, I haven't looked at how ransomware works in any great detail, but it actually be a very good thing to study. It's very important. Fastest growing, most dangerous kind of malware. It's the best way to make money. Anyway, um, so remote procedure call. This is one that has gotten window in a ton of trouble. Um, and we're going through this in a malware analysis and exploit development classes, but especially the malware analysis class. This turned out to be a design decision Microsoft made to make it more profitable to be a software developer. Microsoft is trying to create a platform so people can make a living writing and selling software. So they, if you write a piece, if you write a code, a, a program doing something, and then you write a module that does something like print the file, you might want to connect it to your program, and then when you write another program later, you might want to reuse that code. So Microsoft invented this system where you can take code that was originally part of one program, and you can make it a service and make it available to all the programs on the machine. And then you can connect it to a network socket and put it on a server in the internet and make it available to the whole world, all using the same code. This turns out to be really valuable for people who want to sell their software. 
it's very easy to take your product in a limited environment and take it to a bigger and bigger stage if it's a great product and sell it. But it also means the original developer did not design it thinking about the wider use. And you take code written by someone who was only thinking about making it work in inside one process, and you expose it to the internet, so it leads to a lot of real big security problems. Um, it's very much like what's happening with servers now. People have a server room full of real servers, and they've got their database server and their domain controller and everything, and then they put it all in the cloud. They put it all on Amazon or Azure, and all those machines are now directly connected to the internet when they used to be protected by a firewall or IDS all in one room, and many people don't understand that it's much more dangerous up there. Anyway. So um, my, uh, many Microsoft services exploit this remote procedure call, which is one listening port that connects to many services, many of which are legacy services and were not written to this environment. So it turned out to have a ton of vulnerabilities, buffer overflows and dangling pointers and all sorts of things in those services. So many of the big worms travel by remote procedure calls. Um, and Configure was one of the big, big ones that did this. Um, you'll still see Configure attacking you. You set up a honeypot. It's been around for maybe eight years, infecting millions of Windows machines. One of the weird things about Configure is it doesn't do any harm. People, this is one of the many times when the security researchers cried wolf. Configure infected something like 30 million machines six or eight years ago, and they, were, they updated it vigorously. There were like seven different versions of Configure, and everyone said, any day now, Configure is gonna be used for crime, and it's gonna trash the internet and steal all your passwords, but that never happened. So apparently there's some kind of problem in the underground community. The criminals that spread the virus were not able to negotiate a deal with the criminals that would use the infected machines for crime, and somehow they never got around to actually hurting anybody with it. But it's out there, it's still spreading, you can still catch it, and it places you under someone else's control, but as far as I've heard, they've never actually used that control for anything, it's weird. Anyway, so one of the security um, products you ought to run is Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer. Microsoft made this tool as part of their campaign to improve security. It is a scanner like um, any other vulnerability scanner, but it's specifically designed for Microsoft software. So it needs the administrator password, it can scan one machine or all the machines on a network, and it checks to make sure that everything Microsoft recommends is being done. You're using the right file system, you don't have accounts, administrator accounts with no passwords, you don't have too many administrator accounts, you're using the uh, you have all the patches and security updates and recommended procedures for all your Microsoft products. So it's a good place to start. Now, one of the most famous Windows vulnerabilities has been passed to hash. Uh, if this is Microsoft's single sign-on system. See, if you are at a, if you're at home with just one laptop, then there's no issue and this is not important. But this matters at companies that have a domain. So you go to work, you log in, you're not logging into the local machine, you're connecting over the network to the domain controller. You type in your password, it hashes it, sends the hash over the network, the domain controller looks at the hash and decides your password is correct, so now you log in. But then you wanna go to your branch office file server, and then you wanna go to your part business partner file server over here, and you have to connect to this machine. Now, one way to do it would be every server would require you to give it your password every time you connect. So you'd have to keep logging in over and over again all day long as you touch different systems. To avoid that, Microsoft has to give you a token of some kind and the token has to be sent over the network to tell the second server, this guy already logged in on the first server, don't make him logging in again, we know who this guy is. The problem is, what can that token be? And since that token moves over the network, what if a bad guy steals that token and replays it? And that is a fundamental weakness of single sign-on systems, and Microsoft has had uh, this major weakness from the beginning, and it still has this weakness. So this is called pass the hash. You look on the local system, you find a hash, now you can crack a hash to find the password under it, but if you have a good hashing system, that's difficult or almost impossible. But you can just use the hash, send it over the network, and it will be accepted as a single sign-on token in Microsoft operating systems. And so that's, um, it's a weakness. And there are ways to prevent it, but Microsoft has chosen to, a strange way to protect against this. Yeah, look like I may have a question. It's a good question. You can use third-party single sign-on systems, and I hope they do a better job. Because I don't understand why Microsoft doesn't cryptographically infect this hash every time it's sent. So nothing can be stolen, but they don't. You can just take the hash without cracking it, send it to a server, and it will let you in. 
And Microsoft, Microsoft has strange, what seems to be blind spots. Perhaps there are complicated reasons. I've argued with them about their hashing system for years. I published an article in 2600 years ago. They have the weakest hashing system on the market by far. You'll do that in this class. You'll crack Windows passwords. You can try 100 million Windows passwords in a minute. And you can only try 100 Linux passwords in a minute. Their hashing system is a million times worse than the industry standard. And I don't know why. It's appalling. But they're very, very stubborn about changing it. They, they have some kind of high-level belief that what they're doing is good enough. Anyway, so past the hash attacks were like a wide open door to sneak into Windows machines for a long time, and they finally fixed it with the very latest version. And what they did was they considered the kind of hashes that are out there. There's Kerberos hashes, which are these tickets, which let you have access to a server for 10 hours, and that's the MIT system, and Windows uses that. And then there's the LM and NT hashes. Now, the LM hashes are now obsolete. No modern version of Windows supports them or by, uses them by default. Those are the early ones that were so bad it was trivial to crack them. They're all NT hashes now. But the NT hash, in previous versions, all these red things, so these hashes could be used to log in, and these hashes were retained on every computer you touched. So all you have to do is compromise one machine, get somebody to click on the link, or it's all malware, and then look in the, that machine and find hashes. And if any administrator could ever use that machine, you now have an administrator hash you can use to log in all the network accounts. Uh, and that's the way it used to be. The modern way Microsoft does it now is they've defined a new kind of user. Instead of actually cryptographically changing their system so the hash is harder to reuse, which would have been what I would have liked to see, they chose to make it harder to find the hash in the first place. So they created this new account, which is a high privilege account and now can be siloed. So this machine, you can have, see, so one thing Microsoft has recommended since Windows Server 2000 is every administrator needs to have two accounts. One that's a domain administrator and one that's not a domain administrator. And when they're surfing the web, they'll log in as the non-administrator. And when they want to do an administrative task, they will not log in to a workstation as an administrator. They will right-click and run one process and put in a password to, act to make that one process work. The problem is that's a lot of inconvenience and nobody bothers. Everybody just logs in as an administrator all over the place to get through the day. So what Microsoft now has done is they've made an account that forces you to do that. You make an administrator account and it can only be used on the domain control. You cannot log into a workstation with that account at all. So now you have to log in with your low privilege account, type in the domain administrator privileges to use up there, and there's no hash stored on the workstation of the high privilege hash. So that's their plan, is to not spray these hashes all over the place since they're not secure. Make it so they only get stored on the secure systems and therefore when you compromise an end station, you won't find any high privilege hashes on it. This only works if you have Windows 8.1 or later, and uh, domain controllers are all Server 2012 R2 or later, and if you set it up with these special siloed accounts. But that's their game. That was Microsoft's attempt to patch it. It is strange, you know, because the Linux world upgraded to a much more secure hashing system in 1975, and Microsoft still didn't get the memo. Anyway, um, so NetBIOS is, um, a, she originally had the BIOS, the basic input-output system, and when you boot up your machine, the BIOS will send out probes saying, what have I got? Have I got a keyboard? Have I got a monitor? Have I got some RAM? Have I got a floppy drive? It hunts to see what you have. And that's the basic input-output system that starts your machine so it can tell. Maybe when I was turned off, somebody gave me more RAM. Let's see what I've got. And when it starts up, it, it readies your operating system to use what you have. And NetBIOS scans your local network to see what you have. Maybe there's a server out there. Maybe there's a printer or something I should care about out there. That was their system here. And this was controlled with NetBuoy for the user interface for it. And this was intended for local area networks only. It was designed before the internet was common, which was Microsoft's main focus until Windows 98. So the only point of this was for like in this room, so all the computers in this room would find out there was a printer that they can get to. And so in this, um, however, when the internet became popular, they ported it, like everything else I'm going to say, from the nice, safe environment it was designed for into the internet and called it NetBIOS over TCP. So now the same protocol that was only supposed to be used in one room is now being used over the whole internet. And as you can imagine, this reveals the fact that it has terrible security flaws that nobody thought about. So anyway, uh, Microsoft still has this built into the system. It scans your network looking for, for sharing files. And it's around for old backward compatibility in case your old devices want to use this old system. Most of the time you actually use domain names and TCP IP for networking, but NetBIOS is still around. Um, server message block 
is the technique of sending files over the local network to share printers and files. So this is the way of packaging data in a little TCP package that will send the data to a server so it can be printed or saved. And this turns out to be very insecure. It, when you, if you make a password protected file folder on a file server, so when you connect it has to know who you are, it sends hashes up to it, these NT or LN hashes, and that turned out to be pretty unsafe. So Lovecraft was the one of the first hacking teams back in the days of the cult of Dead Cow and stuff in the 80s and 90s, and they wrote a product called, um, Lof the main product was Lovecraft, which would steal Windows passwords off the wire. They would read the network traffic, find the password hash, and crack the password so they could find out your password just from the network traffic on the wire because of Microsoft's very weak cryptographic protections at that time. Um, and they also had a man-in-the-middle attack called SMB Relay where you would just intercept the traffic and read it before forwarding it on and you could get into any uh, file share easily that way. And it took Microsoft years to patch these. Their, their cryptographic protections, they seem to be very, very stubborn about upgrading them. So somehow an article of religious faith up there or something. Uh, so SMB2 was their attempt to improve this protocol in Vista. Um, and uh, then they, whenever Microsoft makes a big change, they make a whole bunch of new mistakes. And this led to spectacular vulnerabilities. Um, Laurent Gaffey is a researcher that really hates Microsoft. He says their whole secure software development process life cycle is a scam. They don't know what they're doing at all. And one of the things they did not do in the days of Vista was fuzzing, which we do in an exploit development class. Fuzzing is where you test your product by sending deformed packets to it. You take a legitimate packet and you try, let's flip one bit. You try flipping every bit. Then let's flip two bits. Then let's change things so fields that are short are really long. And numbers reach all possible values, even stupid values. And so all these uh, messed up packets at it and see if it crashes. This turns out to be enormously useful. Turns out almost every product that doesn't do fuzz testing needs to because your developers, you read the code, your developers try to think of everything, and somewhere there's some clown that said, oh, I don't need to worry about this number being bigger than 255 because that would never happen. And yet it is possible to send a number bigger than 255 to it, and if you do, something awful happens. So Laurent Gaffey killed uh, Windows Vista with the blue screen of death with a single packet to the SMB port, and then Microsoft patched it, and they were so humiliated, they actually published some of the source code and explained how their source code scanner missed this error. And so next week, he found another one and killed the revision with the blue screen of death. And after that, Microsoft is so humiliated, they've changed their policy, and now they do fuzz testing. They're, they're opposed to it because fuzz testing is a random process. You send random stuff at it, well, it could go on forever. How much is enough? It's never done, so you just have to pick. Oh, I'll try one week of random pack, call that good enough. And they were opposed to such a sloppy testing procedure, but the uh, researchers knew this is how you do it. And this is his entire fuzzer. It is this simple. All he did, and this is this is Python, so wait, all he did is go to Wireshark and catch an SMB packet and then paste it in here. This is a binary SMB packet, and all this does is mutate it by a bit and send all the mutated versions. It's very easy to write this stuff in Python. I'll show you more later. That's why Python is the language of choice for hackers. You can have an idea, and in like one hour in Python, you can write your attack to see what it does. Yeah? You said Python is the language of choice for hackers. What about, uh, in the book, also talks about Perl and Ruby? Um, well, well, the more you know, the better. You should know one language well. And any one of those will do. Every language can do this job. Perl is pretty old. I don't hear much about it anymore. I think that's old fashioned. Um, Ruby is very powerful and fine if you want to learn it. What most people like in America is Python. Python suits the American idea. It's very easy to learn how to write simple Python. And then there's all this depth if you want it. Um, if you know C or Java, those are fine too, but as you know, both of those are very difficult to write in. It will take you a lot longer to get anything done in C or Java because there's a whole lot more framework you have to set up. So you're just trying to get something fast, it's a lot of hassle, but the end result will be a lot smaller and faster and more efficient. So, but you certainly should know at least one programming language. And if you've never done any programming, um, the easiest language to learn is JavaScript, but it only does very little bit inside a browser. The most uh, the sweet spot for most people is Python. That is easy enough to learn that a beginner can get it and powerful enough that you can do a lot with it. But more languages are good. And it's not like there's, and every, every shop has their standards. But most penetration tester type hackers use Python because it's very easy to quickly write up a prototype of something. But plenty of them use C, that's quite common, and a few of them use Ruby. Ruby's not that common, but I think it's coming. And there's a, a ton of languages. There's Go and R and all sorts of languages, yeah. So, 
Yeah, yeah, the Death on the C++ is very good choices, very popular. Um, you can do a lot with that. And the main thing about that is well, if you, well, the main thing is if you know both of them, then you can probably figure anything else out. Because Java is very much like C++, um, Ruby is more or less like Python. You know, once you get one, even one language, makes it easier to learn all the rest. Like, you know, if you learn French, then Spanish and Italian are not that big, it's hard because you've got over most of it. Yeah. Anyway, but whatever you do, you should know at least one language. Um, you're, if you can't do any programming at all, you're like working with one hand tied behind your back. Because many times, you need to whip up a little program to automate something. I'm about to do something, I have to do it a hundred times. Now I really wish I knew how to write a little script, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, so the common internet file system was Microsoft's a replacement for SMB before they had SMB2. And they actually intended for people to use this to share files over the internet. That was a failure. It's so unsafe, nobody does this. Nobody's sensible. You should block this stuff at the firewall. One NetBIOS and SMB, uh, 137, 135, 139, and 445 should be blocked at your firewall. If you want to share files over the internet, use HTTP or FTP. That's what they're for. <laughs> Don't use these Microsoft protocols because they are not safe enough. Um, anyway, I mean, this had a lot of features to try to make you able to share these files in large networks, but I don't think very many people are using them, not over the internet. Anyway, you must have a domain controller on your Microsoft network. You can make a work group like you have in this room where you have 10 or 20 machines uh, sharing a printer, but to have real central administration, you have to have a domain controller, and you must have central administration. Microsoft recommends it for all networks of 10 computers or larger. Even a, even a company like, if this was a company here, we had 20 machines, and we were trying to run a business here. If we hired a new employee, you'd have to walk through each machine and create an account for them on every machine. Then if you make them change their password, how are you going to make sure they change their password on every machine? Then if you fire them, how do you know you've really removed that account from every machine? Then I have a security patch or the next version of something. How do I really make sure it's on every machine? It happens up in the lab. I try to install it, but one of the machines is broken. One of the machines is busy. So I don't really get it on all of them. Within a few months, your business is a mess. The network doesn't work, nobody can, people go and try to use a machine and they can't log in because the account isn't there. You know, you have just a mess. That's what domain controllers do. Everything is in one place. You want to make an account, you make it on the server. You want to make a file share, you make it on the server, you put permissions on it. You want to get rid of somebody because you fired them, you delete their account on the server. Now you know they can't log in anywhere. That's the way to do it. That's what domain controllers are around. You must have one or you'll be out of control of your network very soon. So, there are many different versions of it. Windows NT was the first, then Server 2000, 2003, 2008, 2012, and now 2016. All different versions of domain controllers, and each one is much more secure than the previous one. But, when you make a domain controller, you first install a server version of the operating system, and then you promote it to a domain controller. And when you promote it, you will be asked, do you want to make a native domain controller, or do you want to make a uh, legacy domain controller? You can, because if you, if your company is already running, you probably already have a domain controller. If you make a native domain controller, then you get all the best security features, but if you put in, say, Server 2012, R2, and you make a native domain controller, every domain controller at your entire company has to be Server 2012 R2 or later. And that is almost never the case. You have something you're already using, like a Windows 2000 domain controller, so you choose legacy, so now the domain controller will speak all the old protocols to interoperate with the existing infrastructure using the old version, and then you don't get the security improvements. Now you keep using the old insecure protocols from 2000. So it's a big issue. And this is the fundamental reason why a lot of companies remain vulnerable for decades after people understand a problem because they have legacy infrastructure that can't speak the newer, safer protocol and you don't feel like upgrading that stuff. Like we were saying earlier, people try to have to upgrade so much. Well, this is why. If you don't upgrade your stuff, you stay vulnerable forever because you're using some old stuff. Anyway, so domain controllers have a ton of ports open. They are the heart of your whole network. This is one reason why you should never have just one domain controller. All Microsoft uh, training classes tell you you always have two domain controllers because if the domain controller goes down, your whole network is shot. Nobody can get anything done, so you have a backup one. They used to call one the primary, one the backup. Now they're all equal like DNS servers, but the point is you have to have a second one, and it's running a lot of ports. It's usually DNS server, and RBG server, and main. NetBIOS server, LDAP, and all these things are running on it. So if you do an NMAP scan, you can easily spot a domain controller. It's got about a dozen ports open that are hardly ever used for anything else. 
And it is usually your juiciest target. Taking over the domain controller is typically the goal of the penetration test because if you get domain administrator, you totally control the whole company. So that is proof that you totally got in. That's usually the, the flag you're trying to get. Um, null sessions with a very strange vulnerability we've talked about already. Uh, up until around 2003, Microsoft products would let you log in with an empty name and an empty password and then give you the privilege to see information that is fairly sensitive based on a login like that. That was kind of nuts. And they finally knocked that off. Um, you can enumerate NetBIOS and just see what's out there with a lot of products that will see what's being shared, which is files and printers typically. Um, then there's Microsoft's web server. Back in the days of Windows NT 3.51, um, you could first all, back then, almost all web servers were Unix, and because the internet was a Unix production. <coughs> Mainframes were the only computers back in the 70s, and they all spoke different languages, so they wrote C to make one language to rule them all, and they wrote Unix to be compiled with C to make one operating system to run and everything, and after that, they could have the internet because all the machines spoke Unix, and therefore they could talk to each other. And so the internet, Microsoft completely ignored all of this. They thought the internet was just a waste of time until about 1998. Uh, because they were working on businesses, and all businesses cared about was one room sharing a printer and having cash registers and stuff, and, and they didn't think the internet mattered. So they stayed out of it. So all the standards for the internet were based on Unix. And all the Unix servers showed up all the web pages, and Microsoft jumped in with their Windows NT server and said, we want to make web servers. So they made IIS. And the early versions of IIS were appallingly unsafe, getting hacked all the time, going down all the time. And this is where you started the huge bigotry, sort of, um, where all the Linux administrators had this superior attitude, saying Windows people are just stupid, their servers are just trash, Unix is secure, Windows is not secure. And it was really true at this time that the security difference was monstrous. So IIS, um, when it got to version uh, 4 and 5, it had a lot of ridiculous vulnerabilities, like you could just, just traverse over to CMD and get a command prompt in your browser and issue commands on the server. So IS6 had a, a thing called the uh, a, a lockdown wizard to lock down your IS4 and 5 websites, which Microsoft provided to try to make it more secure, although my friends who ran uh, web servers at that time told me this thing is useless because it would break everything. All your features would quit working. You really had to redesign your whole website on the new web server to get going. But anyway, um, you might wonder, why would anybody use it when you have Unix around? The answer is because of that domain controller. Remember how great it is to have a single point of administration? Well, it turns out you would really like to handle all the email and the web pages and everything and your, your transactions and your financial stuff all in one place too. And it, you can only do that if it's all Microsoft products. If everything you use, if you use Microsoft Instant Messenger, Microsoft Outlook, Microsoft Exchange Server for your email, if you use the Microsoft version of everything, it all can be controlled perfectly from your domain controller. If you have something you get from somewhere else, it's hard to integrate with your network. You're gonna to have to have a separate system for patching it and updating it. So it turns out to be much more efficient for your company to use the Microsoft version of everything and be an all Microsoft shop as much as you can. So you'll put up with IIS, um, even when an Apache server might be easier because the IIS you can control with all your Microsoft uh, control tools. Anyway, SQL Server is Microsoft's um, database server and this is where you store all the financial records. Uh, your company, it's a high um, value target. It's where credit card numbers typically are, and social security numbers, and home addresses, and things like that. And like all the Microsoft products, this thing actually installed on by default with a no password at all on their server administrator account called SA. So you could just log in to a bunch of servers with SA and no password. And by the way, Microsoft wised up after 2005 and quit doing that. But you know who didn't is the open source world. There's been a ton of breaches this year because they invented a new database called Mongo. And MongoDB is super popular. Very few people know how to run it. By the way, people tell me, if you just learn how to spell Mongo, you can get a job. They're desperate for people to set up Mongo. It has some advantage. I guess it's cheaper and faster. But the thing about Mongo is the documentation says, never connect these servers to the internet. They're totally insecure. Mongo is the same. By default, Mongo has administrator access with no password turned on. And about a year ago, somebody scanned the internet and found like 17,000 Mongo servers in use connected directly to the internet with no password. And Chris Vickery at Malwarebytes has been publishing blog after blog. Every week he has another server with a million records of Mongo just hanging out on the internet, everybody's stealing them. So they've reproduced this in the open source world. You know, Microsoft wised up, 
the open source world has an endless chain of new developers to repeat the old mistake again. So Mongo is the new SQL server in this regard. Anyway, uh, then there's buffer overflows. Microsoft's entire programming staff didn't even know what a buffer overflow was until 2002. That's why they said we'll never be able to fix that old stuff because our programmers didn't even know. So buffer overflow is where you define a certain amount of room for data and then you read more data than that and try to put it in a, a field that's too small for it. It doesn't make any sense, but C permits it and that leads to a way to take over machines. Um, it, it, I think this is entirely the fault of C and C++ that assume your programmer is going to handle that. More modern languages like Visual Basic will automatically prevent this. If you save room for 10 characters and then you put in 20, it will automatically reallocate more space to store the 20. Um, but C and C++ are very close to machine language and they value efficiency more than safety. Uh, so Microsoft actually developed a custom library of um, a custom bunch of libraries to add to C to make it safer, and they released those about seven years or six years ago to the open source, so everybody can use the Microsoft alterations in C to make your C safer, and that's a pretty good thing to do. So it removes most of the functions that were so vulnerable and replaces them with safer versions. Anyway, uh, passwords and authentication are very weak all the time. People typically hate passwords and use short ones, use the same ones everywhere. Um, you know, use the, everybody, the most popular password in the world is one, two, three, four, five, six. That's like 10% of all the passwords in every database dump. You know, another real popular one is P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D. You know, as you know, if you let people choose passwords, it's almost the same as having no security at all in many cases. Um, so people have these password rules, like here's, here's hilarious for your book, at least six characters. Who are they fooling? You can do eight or 10 characters these days with brute force attacks. Anyway, there's all these rules, and many, many people are getting really fed up with these rules. I think the US military announced two years ago they're just going to do away with passwords entirely and replace them with something else, which they haven't specified yet, but it would be something like smart cards or thumbprints or something. They figured out that passwords are just a losing game. So smart card is a smart card. Yeah, smart card is a lot better. Smart card is basically a really long password. It's got a cryptographic certificate in it that's something like 2048 bits. And so it's, it's what passwords should be. You know, if, you if your passwords were really 40 characters long random letters, they'd be fine, but nobody can remember passwords like that. So everybody uses their dog's name and... and I know, I know. So, so nobody, there's a fundamental problem here. This is like CAPTCHAs. They try to present with a CAPTCHA to prove you're a human, but the computers are so good at computer vision now, they have to mess up the CAPTCHA so much that the humans can't see it either. So, you're, you know, trying to outsmart computers is just kind of unwise. What about using like LastPass or something like that? Oh, uh, that's, that makes you a lot safer from some attacks. That's what I use. I use a password manager, so now I have a separate password in every website, which is good, but if someone gets to my laptop, they can get in everything. So you just, there's no perfect safety. You choose your vulnerability. So now the primary way people hack me is by getting to my machine, as opposed to finding my password dumped in a data dump and reusing it. You just, that's why you have to do threat modeling. You have to figure out what you're worried about and address that threat. You can't fix everything. So you have to plan what risks are acceptable to you and what risks aren't acceptable. One thing about me is the people who can get to my stuff are students. And most of the students are not malicious. They will like tag my website, but they won't ruin everything. So it's better for the people in the room to have more chance to get to me than the random hackers on the internet who will do rotten things. Anyway, um, so your domain controllers uh, have password complexity turned on by default, so you can't just use P-A-S-S-W-R-D. They have your passwords have to have an uppercase, lowercase, symbol, and number. They have to have three of those four things in them. Anyway, another thing that does help is account lockout. Uh, in the extra credit projects, you can use Hydra. This is like brute force attacks online, where you just try to log in thousands of times from a whole dictionary of passwords or by all combinations of letters. This will only work if I, you'll, your server will actually let me try 10,000 attempts to log in. So you, the normal way to configure servers is where you can only try like five passwords before it locks out your account to stop people from guessing too much. Uh, one thing that they do at the college, which is pretty smart, is if you don't want to spend money wasting time on your help desk, you set it to like a threshold of five logins and then a lockout period will only half an hour. So I did it, I forgot my password, I tried five times, then I said, ah, crap. I go hunt through all my papers, where did I write that thing down? I find it, and I can still get in. I don't need to call the help desk. Anyway, but some kind of, of lock-in threshold should be used for all network logins, because if you don't, some clown will try to get in SSH, for example. If you, as soon as you turn on an SSH server, 
you'll immediately get hacking attacks. There are a bunch of bots out there that scan the entire internet for any open port 22 and they immediately start low and slow password guesses. Every three seconds or so, someone will try to log in with a strange password. Apparently this works. They scan the entire internet and try like the top 1,000 passwords and they run a script and it finds ones where that works and they have an endless chain of new machines under their control. This thing runs and every day or two, you, I've, done, I've put up honeypots with weak passwords just to watch this. You get scanned, after a couple hours somebody finds it and then they log in and don't and vanish and then 24 hours later somebody comes in and starts hacking your machine because there's a guy just running a script then he comes home and says oh i got five let's go play with these five anyway um so these are good things to do and lm hashes are ridiculous they're almost plain text passwords so they should be disabled but nobody should have those unless you're running windows 2003 or should windows xp or earlier in which case you can upgrade those things to nt hashes which are much safer but I think that's not a big issue anymore. When I, about five years ago, something wrong with that one? Let me see. Uh, there needs to be battery. Well, it does. All right, good. Yes, get a right clicker. It won't come on. That's a good. I'll fix that. All right. Let's do these, and then we'll go on to other things. All right, good. So what's the list of vulnerabilities? Giving them all a unique name. All right, I'm quitting at 30. All right, that's the CVE list, common vulnerabilities and exposures. This, by the way, is called taxonomy. This is the first step of science. You give something a name, so now we can tell if we're all talking about the same thing or not. Um, that's the first step. Otherwise, you have 10 reports about a vulnerability, and maybe there's only five vulnerabilities or only one vulnerability, and you have to like agree on a naming system before you can even decide what we're talking about. <laughs> anyway, all right. All right, what's the old insecure Windows file system? All right, I guess I can quit at 25. All right, and that was FAT, the file allocation table. These days, the only place I see it is on thumb drives, and not even that many of them. Anyway, um, all right. Uh, what's the mechanism for a computer to run code on a different computer? So I'll quit at 30. All right, that's remote procedure call, where you call code over a network, which was probably originally intended to be part of a program and then ported to a network. Anyway, this is also Microsoft calls it DCE, the distributed computing environment. This is the genius of the Microsoft system, how you can take your code and repurpose it on a bigger stage and get more value out of it and so developers can make money, but there are security costs. All right, which one of these had no password at all? Which is pretty harsh. All right, and that was the SA account, and SQL Server had no password at all. All right. Uh, all right, which one of these will defend you from past the hash attacks? Uh, I'll quit at 30. 
thirty. All right, those are authentication silos where the high privileged accounts can only be used on high privileged systems so that the hash with privileges is not easy to find. Anyway, all right, well, it's just about 10. Let's pick up at uh, 1020. We'll finish this up. And then I have something to show you I cannot be recording. So let me say what I got here, which is chapter 8, 123, chapter 8A. Right. 